Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Writer's Chat. If you were here with us last week, you know that we had Eva Marie Everson as our guest, and she talked about the word weaver method for critiquing. So this week, we're going to sort of do that. We're not going to quite do it exactly as Eva explained because of time and, and you know, just, just to make it easier. Um, Eva Marie, the word with the word weaver method, it's to do a cold read and then the person, I think it's the person on the left leads and the person on the right reads, <clears throat> got that backwards. So one person That's reads right. and then the other person, you know, and then it goes around for, for comments and using the sandwich method, which I'm sure most of you have heard. It's, you know, to, you know, open with a, a warm nice, positive, encouraging comment, and close with an encouraging comment, and then anything that might be considered, I hate to use the word negative, but you know, that helpful critique, a help, not a criticism, but a helpful critique in the middle. Um, so we're not necessarily doing cold reads today, but we are gonna have Melissa do screen share of the, of the submissions. We're only doing the first pages, and Brandy is going to read them for us, and then we are gonna take turns talking a little bit about each of the submissions. So we've got five, we'll see if we get to all of them. We're really glad you're all here. If you're joining us on the replay, we're glad that you do that too, but we do invite you to join us any Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock Central, 11 o'clock Eastern, and to join our Writer's Chat Facebook um, page group. So uh, I guess we're ready to get started. So Melissa, if you want to share your screen and we, the rest of us are, we're all going to stop our video so you all can see the, the screen. If you have comments, make sure you make them and let's get started. Okay. Can everybody see it? Yes. I Most of it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Do I need right. to just size? Make it bigger? Yeah. Can you make it a little bit bigger maybe? Yay. That helped. For the for yeah. old eyes. Yeah. <laughs> All, All right. right. So Brandy, we're gonna let you go. We're gonna let you read it. And then Jan is going to lead off with the with the sandwich critique. All right. Notes to self after the loss of a loved one. I recently spoke with an older woman after church who mentioned how it had been over a month since she moved into her new house and she had boxes everywhere. Did you downsize homes? I asked. No, it's the same size, but there's fewer closets. Then it's time to start tossing. You don't want one of your kids to have to come in and do all that later, do you? She raised an eyebrow. That's exactly what my son just said. Then it's time to listen. I gave her some tips and encouraged her to let go of what she probably wouldn't even miss. We recently lost a loved one. Hers was a long and well-lived life. Nonetheless, it was jarring when the time came, even after months of a winding down. <clears throat> Three things stuck in my mind during this difficult time in our family. Clean out. The World War II generation is notorious for collecting household items for reuse at a later date just in case. My husband used the word hoarder, but I'd seen enough of those television shows to know he was exaggerating, greatly. There weren't piles to navigate, rotting rodents, or anything that would qualify as a horror show. I'd been at our house a number of times, but was forbidden at outside the main room area. You can't go in there. You didn't know me when I kept a meat house. One month before COVID-19 hit, She'd said she understood why older people sat in rocking chairs and watched life go by. She requested help in finding an assisted living facility. Before the appointments could be kept, the facility shut down. Loved ones talked to her into unloading her VHS collection of TV preachers, her legacy to the children. They explained, and then we don't see the rest of the page. You're muted, Johnny. I am. <laughs> Take two. Thank you, Brandy. Jan, do you want to begin with the critique? Well, thank you. Um, I thought it was good. I enjoyed it. Um, uh, I, we're in, in the midst of trying to do that for my mother-in-law, and something like this can really help others know what to do and how to do it. Um, I, 
a little bit. Um, the first part, lines five and six, and um, I fe felt like it was a little harsh if it's just an acquaintance. So I would like to know if this woman is a close friend and then it's fine. Um, I would add a hyphen on line 10 to well lived. Um, and talking about the hoarders in the clean out paragraph, I understand how that can be and you don't have to have boxes stacked all through your whole house to be a hoarder. It can be all crammed into closets. Um, so it, it's something you might want to expand a little bit on. Um, and in 21, maybe some more detail on why she was sitting in the rocking chair. I thought it was a great, great start. Would like to read more of it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jan. Uh, Melissa? Um, well, I, I do uh, liked it and, and could relate being on the, the cleaning end of those situations with uh, losing loved ones and having to organize things from their home later. So I could, I could relate to that from that perspective. Um, most of what I saw was just um, little things like um, in lines one and two, the use of had been, we could um, cut out the passive voice and, and make that a little more um, present to engage. And I, one suggestion I thought would be to rephrase it to something like, I recently spoke with an older woman after church who mentioned she moved into her new house over a month ago and still had boxes everywhere. And so that kind of makes it read a little cleaner. Um, then line 16, I'm not sure if that's just a, you know, a style thing to, to do the period. Some people like it, some people don't. So this is just a grain of salt suggestion. If, if the punctuation is correct, then you could do after exaggerating, do the M dash and then greatly. And, um, then line 17, um, let me see, I got to scroll down here a bit. Um, my suggestion was to, um, I have to look at my hand and scratch notes, so I apologize for my pausing. I'm looking at little scrawls while going back to the screen. Normally I would put something like this on the screen, but we'll sh can't in this instance, obviously. Um, I'd visited her house a number of times instead of I'd been at her house. I think that would help that line flow a little faster and smoother. That was all I had. All right, thank you. Um, Norma, do you have anything to add? I do. I like the others. I think this could be a very, very helpful piece. Um, some people get to this juncture in life and don't really know what to do. Um, I thought the I had the idea of making lines three and four come first as to kind of grab the reader and then reword lines one and two to fit in after that, to just, like I said, make it grab the reader a little better. Um, I thought uh, line five was a great point because, you know, it's, we shouldn't want our kids to have to go through stuff that we've saved because we might need it later. And my husband and I are very guilty of that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> on line nine, um, you just kind of leave the reader hanging, um, you know, was, was there a goodbye or did she say thanks or get out of my house? You know, what happened there? I just kind of felt like it jumped to line 10, um, without much of a segue. And so at the beginning of line 10, I said, maybe I need a little bit of a segue there. Um, Let's see. And I had um, mentioned later, just as Jan did, that, you know, look into what hoarding means, because the reality TV is like super crazy over the top. Um, let's see. 
And then I just ended with, um, this is a great piece. We need to think about family, especially as we get older and, and you know, the end of life. And I just said, there's a few places that need a little fixing up and, you know, great idea. Can't wait to, to hopefully read more. All right, great, thank you. Um, Brandy. Make sure I'm unmuted after that so rude phone call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I could instantly connect with the topic. And, um, you know, I not too long ago, I was the child cleaning out her parents stuff. Fortunately, my dad didn't have tons and tons of stuff, but you don't have to have tons of stuff for that to really hit home. So this will connect very well with many people. Um, let's see, the dialogue part, I thought it could use a couple of beats in there, um, something just to ground the reader in the exchange, so it's not just um, talking heads. On line 11, it says, even after months of a winding down, I wasn't quite sure what a winding down meant, so maybe slightly different words or something to really say what you're saying. I didn't know if it was a winding down after the passing. I didn't know if it was an emotional thing. Um, I just really couldn't tell what that phrase really meant. Uh, line 12, uh, three things stuck in my mind. I was wondering where are the three things? And it left me questioning, is this two sections of a different piece and the three things are, were cut out and were not included in this submission for critique? or are, is clean out like number one. And if it's number one, I would kind of like to see that that's number one to be able to connect the three things and then the rest of it. So otherwise it's like, where are the three things? <laughs> um, let's see, down on line 17, in the middle it says, I'd been at her house a number of times. Uh, whose house? So nobody's named. Was it talking about the older woman at church? And if so, I would just re-reference who the her is so that the reader can understand whose house um, the person is at, you're at. Um, and that's really all I had for um, suggestions. I thought the whole text was very easy to follow and was a clear line of thought most of the way. Um, I think this great piece and like others said, really helped a lot of people. All right, really good. Um, I agree that the it's a well-written piece. The writing is pretty strong. There's a little bit of things like was mentioned about a little bit of passive voice and helping verbs and maybe restructuring a bit, but the writing is pretty strong and that's really good. Um, I wasn't sure reading this that this is the actual first page of the manuscript though. It seemed like we're kind of jumping into the middle maybe of a chapter. And if it is the first page of the manuscript it's like, I, we don't know who the I is. And I think there would need to be some explanation of, of who the narrator actually is, who, who's the I in this piece. But if that's already been explained and like this is, you know, the first page of a chapter in the manuscript, maybe that's already there. So I, that's all I had. And anyone else want to add anything or we can move on to the next one. Okay, great. Thank you for whoever sent that in. If you're not with us right now, I hope you watch the replay because that really was a good, good piece of strong writing and a good, good kickoff. Okay, who's what's next, Melissa? I am searching. Okay, <laughs> my special daddy. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, uh, there. Send that in for you. All right. We're moving to fiction. Hey. My special daddy, spring 1960. Any man can be a father, but it takes someone special to be a dad. Ann Geddes. Suey, 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 daddy yelled, and all the pigs came running. Hurry, Wanda, daddy is feeding the baby pigs. I grabbed Wanda's hand as we ran barefoot up the hill. We didn't even care about the mud squishing between our toes. Laughing until we cried, we could barely make it to the pen. Shooey, shooey, I copied daddy. He looked at us and smiled. Girls, here's some slop. Give some to the mama pig. It's her favorite. He stood among the pigs, unafraid. 
They ate feverishly as if they might starve. Daddy, look, she's eating right out of my hand, I said. Turning around, I saw Wanda rolling around in the mud, laughing. Wanda, get up. You're ruining your clothes. Daddy looked at us and realized he was going to be in big trouble and mama when they got back home, when we got back home. Come on, girls, let's get you cleaned up before mama sees you. He picked us up and stood us on the hood of his big car. All right, girls, turn around while I hose you off. That's cold, daddy. We squealed and giggled as we danced on his car. What in tarnation happened to you girls? Mama winked at daddy when we returned home because she knew this was the way daddy showed his love. Linda fed all the pigs. Oops, Linda fed the pigs all by herself today, he said proudly. What's for dinner? All right, thanks, Brandy. That was good. Uh, Melissa, we're gonna let you start off with this one. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I think this is a cute piece. I like I like the, the mental image I get of the little girls helping their dad out with the pigs. Um, so that was fun to look into it and see a, a nice positive lighthearted piece. Um, my uh, first initial thought was the, the treatment of the, um, I lost the word I'm going for now. <laughs> The, um, the time placement, the spring of 1960, and that quote from Ann Geddes, um, I think that you might want to switch those. This, this might be a style thing, so I'm not sure, but um, it, it kind of pulls you out of the piece to have the quote right down there unless a character is actually speaking it, which I don't think was the intention. So I would, would switch them and uh, do a little extra spacings to show the distinction that this, the quote is giving context to the piece and then have the timestamp um, above the, the actual scene. And I'm, I'm also not uncertain about that, but I think that um, there may need to be a font treatment for the timestamp that it might need to be in italics. Somebody else might need to fill in on that one. It may also be a style thing. Um, let's see. Uh, on lines uh, three, or on line three. Um, sorry, again, I'm, I wasn't prepared to go first, so I'm, I'm looking at my hand scratch and trying to read what I wrote. <laughs> um, I already covered that. Okay, sorry, line four. Um, I don't think that um, we need a comma after daddy yelled because of the natural pause and and. Uh, the one thing that I did notice in this piece that would help is there seems to be a bit of head hopping going on between characters. And um, since we are in, this little girl's point of view, she um, is presuming upon her, her father's thoughts a lot. And, and there are things that go on that I think would be only the daddy would know and that the girl might not know, pending on her age. We don't really fully know the context, but we presume from the dialogue and the actions that they're very young little girls. Um, so, uh, I, I was thinking that right off the bat, it might be nice to have context of who our POV character is closer to the beginning. Down at the bottom, we see her father refer to her as um, Linda. And so it would be nice to have her up at the top mentioned somewhere. Maybe maybe her father says her name when talking to her or, um, or something like that. So we can kind of connect right off the bat with our POV character. Um, See. 
Um, can somebody else just jump in and do the critique right now while I read over my notes? I really didn't have a chance to prepare just yet. Um, absolutely, absolutely, we can do that. Norma, um, you want to? You want to your turn? I do. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, I think, as Melissa said, this is a super cute piece. It's a fun, it's fun, it's whimsical, um, you know, a, a day on the farm with her daddy. I thought that was really sweet. I did pick up, as Melissa said, it a few, a couple of places of uh, POV violation. Um, and um on line nine where he says girls we knew wanda's name but we don't know the other girl's name so i kind of felt like she was just this invisible person um don't know her name don't know what she looks like um so that might need a little working and i wasn't sure also on line nine where it says here's some slops do farmers call it slops or do they just call it slop here's slop feed the pigs um, and that's just a question because I wasn't raised on a farm. I don't know, um, but it just didn't feel like it flowed right. And then down on line 20, um, mama winked at daddy when he returned home. And I felt like you should have just left it at that because again, she didn't, she saw it, but as a little girl, would she understand why? And if she does, and say she, uh, you know, and add something to the effect that she knew um, that mom winked. That was how mom expressed, you know, love or you're cute or good idea or whatever. This is really a sweet piece at the very beginning. Honestly, it made me think of Charlotte's Web. And so, um, you know, a cute piece, a ton of potential and just be careful of jumping POV unless you're going to do the, um, I believe it's called omniscient where you're writing everybody's POV. Um, other than that, it's, it's great piece. I loved it. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna say right now, because it is written in first person, there is no way to have an omniscient point of view unless you're writing as an adult remembering your childhood memories and that's not the case that we have going on here so it's definitely happening in right. story time um, right. yeah but thanks for, that's that was important thanks for bringing that up brandy do you have anything to add yeah a uh, couple things um i really appreciated what seems to be a very special i know it says my special bag is a title but a very unique uh, relationship between the dad and the girls um that not every little girl gets that and i think it's neat to, to see that um i noticed that the word daddy and then the word girls both appear multiple times in a very short space and I'm not sure he would constantly say girls, girls with them there. I think he would probably just say what he was going to say without the girls and would just be looking at them. Um, also, I don't know if this is designed to be like a picture book or a children's article story, magazine story. Um, no such thing as an article story, really. Um, if it's designed to be a picture book, um, a lot of the picturing of what's happening, the illustrations would need to carry some of that. So that would help. If not, then it would need to be put in um, more descriptive. Um, but like the others, uh, I had a little bit of a difficult time following who was talking and really didn't know the main point of view character because she wasn't named right at the start and because it opened up with the dad yelling, not from the POV character doing something. Uh, it doesn't say, suey suey, I heard my dad yell. It says, suey suey, daddy yelled. So I thought daddy initially was a point of view character. I also was wondering, um, the little section of going to feed the pigs and all that, um, What I was trying to figure out what was the reason for that little segment before they went back to see the mom. Um, was it that she got to, uh, the main character, Linda, got to feed the pigs? Um, I would have liked to better understand the reason that 
that whole little section happened because I couldn't quite grasp why that why that was important, why that scene was important before they, they went there and then they left and wasn't sure. Um, so just kind of think about that a little bit. And then um, I noticed in a couple spots that chronological order doesn't happen very well. Things are a little out of order. And to give an example, line 19 says, what incarnation happened to you girls? Mom winked at daddy when we returned home. Well, it's mama that's making the statement, but she's making the statement before they return home. So you want to have them return home first and then have her make the statement so that it follows a proper chronological sequence. Um, but I thought this was really um, a nice little story, um, some good development going on, and it'd be interesting to see where it went. That's really good. Um, I really appreciate what you had to say, that, that last part about chronological story, because that's one of those it's almost like a, um, it's not a basic fiction technique. It's kind of more of an advanced fiction technique that a lot of people don't pick up on, but it is something to be aware of that you have things happen in the right order. And that was something that had caught my attention too, was all of a sudden they're home and they weren't home and you've got mama speaking. So that's, that was really, really good to, to bring that up. And the other thing, I like the piece too. I mean, I am a farm girl, so, you know, it, it, it really is special that way. Um, but when the dad said at the end, it's kind of like Linda fed the pigs all by herself today, but there was nothing before that, that it's like, why is he so proud about that? Because she had showed no fear. She had showed no hesitation. So it's like there, there seemed to be a little bit of a disconnect there so but yes like the others I thought was a, a fun fun piece and I'm not sure whether it's fiction or I said fiction at first but it could be a memoir it could be autobiography as Brandy said it could be a picture book could, you know we're not sure what it is but um but I too think it has potential and, and just enjoyed the kind of like the slice of life of, of this piece all right Melissa did you have anything else to add or did everything kind of get covered I think that you really covered a lot of what I was going to say. A lot of it was just the, the being attentive to the head hopping and the mm -hmm. place time. And, and um, you know, a lot of it's very, very simple fixes. Right. Then too, you know, um, again, it really does depend on what the intent of the book is, whether it's a memoir or a children's book or something like for me, I felt like there needed to be more of a sense of place for the scenery and stuff like where are they can we can we get a little more visual and the leads thoughts about where they're at or what actions she's doing to to give us a setting but if this is a picture book then you'll see it and so you don't need that so yeah it just depends on the piece and and um, what the intent of the author is i again just really really liked it i thought it was very cute and mm -hmm. endearing yeah so, you know, whoever sent this in, thank you very, very much. And, and I do want to say it is so brave and courageous to do this. I mean, I've done this before, too. And it's um, it's 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 a scary thing to have, to have your work critique. So thank you for sending in these pieces and know that everything we say is well intentioned and to be encouraging and to help you improve as a writer, not to discourage you in any any way. So, okay, so we're ready for the third one, I think. Um, which one is that? Uh, <laughs> yours. <laughs> it's yours. I'm, I'm the, on the spot. Okay, I can't critique in this one, but I can no, sure share. <laughs> um, okay, Brandy, whenever you're ready. Okay. Make sure I'm All right. Episode one, Thoman, Ireland, 961 AD. Concern needled Tiernan as he walked the cattle pasture in search of their missing cow. Her calf was due any day. She'd not come to feed with the others in his care. If anything happened to her, twould be his hide at stake. Damp grass enveloped his woolen wrapped legs as he stamped the numbness from his feet. Weaving through the dense cold cops in the hills above their cottage, he tried to peer through the trees for any sign. This would be her first calf. First time deliverers were prone to difficulty. It was bad enough, the losses the herd suffered through the winter months. Now this, 
Do you hear a bell? Gideon MacDavid called. Tiernan glanced over his shoulder. Nothing, my lord. It chafed him to bow and scrape to Lord Davin's sons on the best of days. Sharing herdsman duty with Gideon, Davin's thirdborn, demanded care to demonstrate the submission befitting a tenant, a burden on Tiernan's every task. Dust's upon us. If she's down with her cap, we may not see her. Gideon's breath puffed in the air, in the chill air, as he waved a hand to the glowing sh shadows. Tiernan pressed on at a quicker pace. Gideon matched his stride for a time, but soon surpassed him, being a mite longer in the legs, yet another irritant. At 15, a year Tiernan's junior, Gideon stood a good hand span taller. Of course, all Lord Davin's children were tall, hardy stock, a strong trait that ran through their noble Delphi blood. Very good, thank you. Okay, um, Norma, your turn to start us off. Yes, this is a great, great piece. Um, these characters seem a little familiar, <laughs> um, and I love it. And the um, on line six, she uh, she did not come feed with the others in his care. Um, I'm not sure if in his care is needed. Um, it's clear that it's a, a herd that he's watching, and that's why he's concerned over this one. So not sure if that's needed, just float it or flush it. Um, on line nine, he tried to peer through the trees. Uh, would that be peer through the cluster of trees, peer through a tree, a young... A young reader might get confused, you know, like, is he trying to look through a tree trunk? Does he have powers? Um, just, you know, something that made me stop and go, what? Uh, and then uh, I loved a, that it was a burden on Tiernan's every task um, that really gave the weight to what it was to be a servant um, under such a not nice person or somebody that lorded it over him. Um, other than that, oh, there was one other thing on line 18, where you talk about breath of pub in the chill air, would that not be chilled air? Or just, again, ask uh, I think grammatically it would be chilled air, but I'm not 100%. Um, this was a great work, a great story. Um, I could feel the anxiety, the, not, I don't know if anxiety is about the right word, but the anxiousness of needing to find this cow um, that was calving, um, especially with the um, the, the king or the, the person he was ser subservient to, that that person just a little bit old, you know, was following him around doing his job while he did his job. So you could feel the tension there. Great, great job. Good story. Can't wait to read more. All right. Um, Brandy. Well, Melissa, as you know, I love the stories. <laughs> and Somehow my mouth still manages to trip up reading their, their character names. <laughs> but um, I thought this was um, very well written. Um, line five, um, what was mentioned is she did not come to feed with the others in his care. Because of its placement, I initially thought um, that this line wasn't needed because I, I, for some reason. But then I realized in this reading, that it probably is just maybe a little bit out of order. So I would probably stick that up right after he says that, right after the first line in search of the missing cow, just to connect it better to her missing and that she didn't come with the others when the rest had come to feed. Um, number nine, this would be her first calf. This is the second construction of a would be. The first one was up on line six. So maybe switch up the wording just a little bit. And then the very next line after that on line nine, first time deliverers, I would probably change that to deliveries. Um, just for some reason, deliverers just struck me wrong. But that's just, you know, I nothing, nothing 
important, really. Um, I didn't see very much else in here because I liked so much of this. I thought the characters were very easy to picture, as was the scenery. Um, it was easy to read, easy to follow, and I thought it was very well written um, overall. So I don't have much constructive criticism to give other than to say it's really good writing. All right, um, Jan, your turn. I en enjoyed it. I, this is the first I've read of your things and um, you have good descriptive writing. I can place myself there um, and I can feel Tiernan's angst at somebody coming along with him and making him feel like, oh, do I have to do this with him here? Um, line seven, I believe you need a hyphen on woolen wrapped legs. Um, and on 20 hand span, I think that's one word. Um, again, I love your descriptions. Um, I feel like I'm there watching the, the two of them and wanting to be able to peek into the woods to see if I can help them. Good job. All right, and of course, we're, we're going to go ahead and say, Melissa wrote this and submitted it, so she's not gonna do any critiquing. Um, this is such an excellent first page because of all that it does. And when you're writing fiction, that first page has to just, it has a lot of work to do. You know, the first chapter does. But in this one, we um, down a little bit, I'm not sure where it was, but I just noticed it a second ago. So I think it's past line 16, which is the only one I can see. Yeah, down there, 18, 19. She's even, Melissa's even gotten this character's age in there in just a very nice way without just saying he was, he was, um, he's 16. So the other guy's 15, right? A year, his junior. So, you know, just being able to get that age in there without just stating it is really good. We know who the main character is. We know who we're gonna be rooting for in this story. We've got the setting, we've got the angst, we've got problems and issues. We see his place in the world. And besides that is just a strong voice too. And there's a rhythm to, to Melissa's language, which is just wonderful. So, very, very good. Very good piece. All right. Anyone else have anything else to say about this one? And if not, we will move on. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. That was really, that was really great. Okay. So we got another one. Our North Pole Adventure. All right, our North Pole adventure. It's December 1st, Jocelyn's big day. She had won a contest at school for her and four other children to spend a week at the North Pole. She invited her brother Teague and cousins Kenzie, Aubrey and Zoe. Jocelyn couldn't quit smiling and fidgeting while waiting for Santa to come to pick them up. Hearing bells ringing, uh, hearing bells jingling, Jocelyn ran and looked out the front window. She saw Santa's sleigh as it landed on their front lawn. He hopped out of the sleigh with a jump in his step. Santa's here, Jocelyn yelled. Jocelyn ran and threw open the front door. Santa, she squealed, rushing into his arms. Santa chuckled. Hi, Jocelyn. Hi, she said, blushing. She was so amazed to see Santa, she could hardly talk. The other kids jumped up and down, screaming, Santa, Santa. Is everyone ready to go to the North Pole? Asked Santa. Yes, they sang out in unison. Put on your heavy jackets, mittens, and hats. Let's go. Mrs. Claus can't wait to meet you. Kenzie asked, can we meet the elves too? Of course, said Santa. They scrambled out to the sleigh, yelling with excitement. Jocelyn climbed in with Santa. Kenzie and Zoe sat in the middle row. Aubrey and Teague climbed in the back row. Their parents stood on the front lawn watching them get settled, waving, waiting to wave goodbye. 
Have fun, they called out. Santa picked up the reins and whistled to the reindeer to let them know it was time to fly. All right, great, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna start. Brandy, you get to start with this one right after reading it. Yeah, um, this is, uh, I, could, I can really sense the excitement in this story with all of the kids. I mean, what kids wouldn't be excited to meet with Santa? And I'm sitting here wondering how did this fantastic school and this make this great contest and connect with Santa to be able to meet with Santa? That's like amazing in itself. Um, so I think the whole thing is just surrounded by it. A great deal of fun. So this really stands to be an interesting story and I'm really curious to know what happens in the rest of the story. Um, I'm actually going to start kind of at the bottom because it was the first thing that I caught because it tripped me up when I read, which is why there was a little pause at the end. Line 22, um, their parents stood on the front lawn watching them get settled, wave, waiting to wave goodbye. Have fun, they called out. Have fun should be in quotations, and then they called out would be outside of quotations and the exclamation point would be after that fun. So that caught me when I, I was reading. So you probably heard me pause from before I finished the rest of it. So um, before I forgot about that, I wanted to point that out um, so that that wouldn't be missed. Um, goodness, let me take a moment just to review, because I read, but Ah, yes. Um, there are a lot of instances of Santa. One of the things that my ears always pick up is when words are repeated frequently. And so, of course, Santa is one of the ones that I hear repeated frequently. I, I really love, by the way, the variation of the children's names. Nothing repeats. Everything sounds different. And I thought that was very good. Uh, oh, oh, well, there is one little repeat that maybe you didn't notice, and that's Ken Z. Aubrey, Zoe, they all end with an E sound. So on the surface, they look a little different because they start differently, but the endings are a little bit different. I mean, the ending sounds of the names are a little bit the same. So maybe something to look at and maybe modify that a little bit, but they're interesting names. They're not boring Jane Doe kind of names. You know what I mean? So that's really good. Um, because I read and I haven't had a chance to really look much at my notes, I'm going to defer to the okay. next person to critique. So in the interest of time so that we can get some other things, but I thought this has a lot of fun potential to it. It does, it does. Okay, great. So Melissa, do you have anything to, to add? Um, I totally agree. I think it's cute and you can feel the excitement in the characters as they're getting to meet Santa for the first time. And, um, even Jocelyn, I like that how she's all gung ho and ready to go, and then all of a sudden taken back when she realizes and she's blushing, and it's cute. But um, again, it would also depend on the context of this, whether it was a picture book or not. If it's a picture book, then my first initial thought probably won't matter so much. I was kind of curious about the setting where they were at since school was mentioned. My first thought was, well, maybe they're at a school, but then as you're going on, it kind of looks like they're at her house. And so um, maybe just a little, little quick something in there to give us a sense of place, unless it's a picture book and then it'll show it. And so. Um, that was my first thought. Um, then on line 12, um, I'm not sure. I think there might need to be a comma after screaming there. And then line 17, um, personally, I'd like to see the dialogue come first and the attribution come after. So it just does a sense of timing what happened first. Um, since this is all supposedly from Jocelyn's point of view, she would then be attributing the speaking to Kenzie before she actually said it. Um, other than that, and, and Brandy already caught the, um, the part on line 22. So yeah, I, th I think that that was all that I um, really had to add to it. I thought it was very clearly written and, and easy to follow all along. I, it's, it's engaging and it, yeah, I was curious about the school and about how um, these kids would suddenly get this awesome opportunity. And so it made me wanna know more about the story too. 
All right, um, Norma, your turn. Oh, you're muted, Norma. Sorry about that. Um, I thought this was a cute story and what young child, I'm presuming this would be like kindergarten or first grade, because um, nowadays pretty much after that, they, they know it's not true. Um, so, but if it's a picture book, then enough said. I mean, it could even be pre-K and still be considered at school. Um, I wasn't sure the significance of the date where you open up, it's December 1st. Um, you know, just wasn't sure. Like I said, this is just one piece. I don't know if this is the beginning, the middle or whatever. Um, I, I thought that she had won a contest, could just be she won a contest at school. Um, and then um, maybe instead of Jocelyn couldn't quit smiling, she kept smiling and fidgeting. Um, again, that's just couldn't quit, you know, is, is a little different, but if you need to tighten it, there you go. Um, the next big thing that kind of stood out, let me find it. Um, line six and seven, where it says, um, jo uh, hearing bells jingling, Jocelyn ran and looked out the front window. Then the next is she saw. Um, Jerry Jenkins would say that, that if she's looking out the window, we understand whatever comes next that she saw it. So you might not need to say that. Um, you can maybe just put a comma and there sat Santa sleigh or um, something to tweak it where you don't need, need that. Again, float it or flush it. Uh, let's see. She was so amazed to see Santa, she could hardly talk. Again, depending on who you're writing that for, that sounds like telling, you know, could you show us where her eyes big, you know, that kind of thing, where she's stuttering, that kind of thing. Uh, let's see. And as uh, Mel Melissa mentioned, the uh, it's better to put your dialogue and then the tag after. But anyway, this is such a cute, another whimsical story. And kudos to this school for pulling off something so great. But it's really sweet. And I can't wait to, to, to hear about the, or see the end result, whether it's a children's story or an actual picture book. Good writing pulled me into the excitement. You could feel it. Um, I could just imagine having had kids myself, plenty of them. Um, the excitement and the jumping up and down and all the craziness that goes with it. Great, great job. That's great. And um, yeah, I feel like this is such a good piece that we're actually, you know, being able to really be nitpicky about things, which is actually a good thing, right? Because it's like overall, it is, it's such a fun, fun piece. So people said kind of what I was thinking already. So I'm not going to repeat that, except on line six where Jocelyn ran. Um, and then also in line nine, Jocelyn ran. So you probably want to get rid of at least one of those. She could just, Jocelyn threw open the front door. Um, but what I love about this is how many wonderful verbs there are. I love verbs and you want those action verbs, you know, so she's the smiles, the fidgets. Santa hops out of the sleigh. He's got to jump in his step. Um, I think there's, you know, the bells are jingling. There's just all these great, great, strong verbs. The kids are screaming, you know. Um, down later, they're climbing into the sleigh. Climbed is used twice. I think one sentence right after the other. So you probably would want to switch that out a little bit. But it's, but I love, I love those action verbs. So. Kudos to Jan, it's such a cute, cute story. Um, did I cover, Brandy, did you have anything else to add on that one? Um, yeah, I would say there were a couple of spots of telling, um, like line six, which I know you can't see, which is not a big deal, I'll just say it. Um, hearing bells jingling, and it says she saw Santa sleigh. I mean, you could do something, you know, bells jingled. Jocelyn ran and looked at the front window. Santa sleigh landed. 
Um, and that would be a little bit more in the moment, more active and more visual. And um, readers would be able to really grasp into that a little bit more than um, the way that it's currently written. Um, and then there, are, I think, were a few little elements I saw that um, were missed, like um, when Santa tells the kids to run and get their coats and their boots and everything, but then they never do it. They, everybody's just climbing in. So I would just say, you know, show that they've got their stuff. They, they grabbed this and popped in and that kind of thing. Um, but other than that, um, that's uh, the only other thing that I would add uh, right now. We can probably move on to the next piece. I still think it's uh, got a lot of neat things and I really am curious what's going to happen <laughs> afterwards, what, the, you know. Yeah. That's good. Okay, do we have another one, Melissa, or are we good? You're muted, sweetie. <laughs> okay. yeah, we do have another okay. one. I just need to. This is one we'll get to do the for real cold sandwich way, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. No one and I can read it off the screen if you would like. Okay, good. You just got to make the words big enough. <laughs> All right. Terminal romance. Travelers cross the terminal at arrivals and come across Rose's tiny kiosk. The saleswoman has become a florist. Goodbye sweaters and piles and ready to wear racks. Hello, tiny flower island in the heart of the huge terminal. Being the boss requires everything, long days and no vacations. Nearing burnout, she finally takes on an apprentice. Melanie arrives with her piercings and her gothic look. Rose finally gets a vacation and a nice fluorescent sign. To live is to offer a bouquet of flowers. The slogan is simple, effective. Rose is building customer loyalty. Her cheeks take on their natural pinkish hue. She blossoms. Melanie is the first to talk about him, him, quite not the ordinary man. Rose, look at this guy. Oh my, Bradley's Co Bradley Cooper's lookalike. Rose smiles and sighs with ease as soon as his tall stature emerges in the terminal. Melanie calls out, alert, Bradley in sight. So funny. Rose, did you see his name tag? Couldn't, he pays in cash. By the look of his fancy suit, he must be a traitor. Rose is having trouble recovering from a complicated love affair rooted in Bill Withers, just the two of us, tune and flowers. Each time the tune is played in the terminal, the open wound bleeds. Now this Bradley customer reminds her of one detail and not the least. He gives flowers. All right. Um, okay, can Jan, you're up again. I enjoyed the story. Um, it's descriptive. Um, I understand the burnout and needing time to get away. I thought that was really good. Um, this is harder to do cold. <laughs> Usually in word weavers, they give us a couple of minutes to um, look. Yeah. It was, but yeah. I know time. Yeah. We just can't. Um, we can't have a couple minutes here. I'm sorry, you're, you're the one that got put on the spot for... Um, burnout, I think, is one word. It, I don't have numbers on this. Mm -hmm. So we're, it's in the second paragraph, nearing burnout. Um, I love the line to live is to offer a bouquet of flowers. That's sweet. Um, I like that she's building her customer loyalty and that's really good. Um, and alert Bradley insight is it, it might be two or one word, not two. I see the rest of the stories here. I'm going to read the rest later. <laughs> good job. Yeah. Yeah. I want to read it too. Uh, Melissa. Um, 
Well, right off the bat, I'm, I'm assuming that this is an omniscient POV, but so that's kind of what throws me is I'm not entirely certain of the POV. Um, there's parts of it that almost seem personal and the other parts it's more like the, the floating narrator looking down and kind of telling what's going on in the scene. So uh, I would kind of like a little more clarity there, but uh, yeah, I, I was automatically sucked in and I could kind of picture this airport terminal and, and all of this going on. And you know, I'm a sucker for romance so right off the bat, that got me like, okay, a romance story. Yeah. <laughs> I, didn't. I like. I like the exchange between these characters. Um, here again, you would want to um, give these the proper treatment for dialogue with the quotations. And um, I don't know if, if this being omniscient, whether how you want to treat the, the uh, attributions, but yeah, I, I would like to see an attribution to who said it uh, at least a couple of times. So we have a place of where we're at. Um, yeah. Okay, um, Norma. Um, I'm with Melissa, I'm a sucker for a romance. So I was like, all right. And I love the, right away we know where we are, travels come across the terminal. So we know it's either uh, most likely an airport terminal. I mean, I realized uh, bus places are usually depots, so I just automatically jump to we're at an airport. Um, the only, in the beginning, the thing that kind of made me go, huh, was the saleswoman had become a florist. Um, maybe tweak that or just leave it. It's just me. Um, and the other, I like the description of Melanie arrives with her piercings. You could take out and her, just take out that second her. Uh, Melanie arrives with her piercings and gothic look. What a great description of what Melanie looked like. Uh, and then this other lady, Rose, finally gets a vacation and a nice fluorescent sign. Um, so that to me, that just draws us into the story right away. The only other thing, just with without having to, to spend much time looking over it, the next thing that really caught my attention is where Rose smiles and sighs with ease. I don't know that we need with ease because the context of the setting is here's this good looking guy. <sighs> so, you know, I, I don't know that the with ease is needed. And again, um, with Melissa, I would like to see the quotation marks and the, and the tags and things in there. It is a sweet story and I want to read more. And it's good job, well done. Okay, Randy. Um, the first thing that I uh, noticed uh, that I really liked about it was the voice of this piece. Um, it, it's got a distinct voice the cadence of the sentences and the way everything is pieced together. Um, I really liked the dialogue. I thought it was realistic and believable how they spoke to each other. Um, let's see. I do agree um, with the others in the omniscient point of view and all that. I really would like to see a point of view character established and then follow along. I think it would make it easier to follow um, the sequence of events in this um, really cool setting. Um, Cause some of it, it, I feel like it's kind of, I have pieces floating out here. They're really great pieces and they're visual pieces. And I have a little bit hard, a hard time anchoring them to um, a character. And I feel like I need that because stories do revolve around a character. So you have to know who to root for. Um, so that's, that's something I would really like to see that I think would help this piece to be um, the full story that it um, wants to be. Um, would you scroll down to the lower half? Um, and the, the other thing that I saw that kind of jarred me a little bit was the last paragraph on this page, Rose is having trouble recovering from a complicated love affair. Um, that's basically one giant telling, and I wasn't really sure how that connected to everything else. 
Um, and I think part of that's because I don't know who the point of view character is. Um, and if we did have a point of view character, if it happens to be Rose, then you could get the internal thoughts and feelings and the, all of those things that you um, like books and stories for versus movies, you get those internal thoughts and feelings. Um, and then that could, you, then, then it could show um, what kind of trouble, what, what does that mean? How, how, how is she struggling? The internal emotions and the feelings that will help us to really connect to the character and just really feel what the character's feeling and then become part of the character and even more into the story. I love the aesthetics um, that you've created with the scenery and the colorful words. I don't think that the colorful language is over the top. Um, so I think it's a, a good balance, um, but it, I'm with Jan. I kind of would like to read the rest of this piece. And if you have the rest of this piece, maybe I'll uh, take a peek. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I, I'm just got a couple things too. I'm, I'm gonna put, have you go back down to the bottom where, where you just were, Melissa, thank you. I, I love this thought, though I agree with Brandy that it is definitely, I mean, we've kind of removed ourselves from the story and it's it's a little bit of an info dump right here. But this idea that her complicated love affair is rooted in this, I mean, just the way that's said, the complicated love affair rooted in Bill Withers, just the two of us, tune in flowers and each time it's played, the open wound bleeds. I mean, doesn't your heart just bleed from reading that? and? It, and so even as you have to tweak that to put that, make it not an info dump, that thought, that concept, that those words still need to kind of be there, I think, because it just, I just thought it was so good. And the other line that I just absolutely, absolutely love is that at the top. And I just thought it was so cute when Brandy read it and then just reading it again. I just love this. Hello, tiny flower island in the heart of the huge terminal. I. I don't know, that may be your opening line right there. It is just such a cute, sweet line that says so much more than those words. It, I, it's so descriptive and I just see a lot in that. It just resonates with me. So that's, um, anybody else have anything? I think then everybody got a chance. So. Okay. Well, thank you again to everybody that was courageous enough to put your pieces up here and let us do this. Again, I know, yeah, come on in everybody, if anybody wants to. And if you're in Writer's Chat, GL, let us know. Um, this was a lot of fun and I hope that you were encouraged by it and the pieces were really good. We've got a lot of energy in, in these stories, which is always a, a fun, fun thing. We're really beginning to run a little late. And so I'm gonna quickly say that next week, we, I hope you saw the announcement in the Writer's Chat Facebook group. We're going to have an open mic uh, discussion on a book, which I don't have in front of me. I bought it on my Kindle because there's two editions and my print edition is the older one. So I bought the newer one and I don't have my Kindle right here with me. So if anyone has it, wants to hold it up, it's Cecil Murphy's um, Unleash, Unleash the Writer Within. It's, thank you. Um, it's uh, just a, it's not a very long book and it's very personable. And I just um, think we're gonna have a lot of fun just talking about it. Um, anyone have any final comments, anything they wanna say? I'm, I'm just I, like, say I love critiquing. <laughs> I just find it so, sorry if I cut somebody yeah, off. You're fine, Joe, go ahead. Okay. I just, you know, I am part of Word Weaver, so I know this type of method. I'm also part of another critique group where we just read our pages personal, you know, individually, and then everybody kind of jumps in and gives their opinions. Uh, and I love both ways. I find it so incredibly helpful. And um, one of the great things about it is you begin to overcome the fear that you have <laughs> of having other people listen to what it is you're writing. And that has helped me tremendously over the years. I'd just like to thank everyone that turned the uh, first page in. It was fun reading them. Good luck with them. And we have some talented writers. Mm -hmm. um, none of those were significantly flawed. They just needed some tweaking and rewording. 
Y'all are awesome. Great job. Great, great job. I agree. That, those were a lot of fun to, to read. Okay. Um, anything else before we go? All right. We will see you next week. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, have a great week and go right. Bye. <laughs>